So I just want to speak for a few minutes from the employer perspective and share with you some of the things that employers should be thinking about right now. If I were to identify one substantial change from life as you know it under Massachusetts health care reform and life as you will know it under the Affordable Care Act and the reforms it brings is that your employees now have more choices than they did before. What do I mean by that? Right now, if an employer in Massachusetts meets the fair share contribution test, and that hasn't been a difficult hurdle for employers to meet. Employers meet that. If you meet that, your employees who are eligible for health insurance did not have the health connector as an alternative. The fact that you offered insurance and met the fair share contribution limit test prevented your full-time employees who are eligible from going to the connector. That changes now. In essence, all of your employees, even if you provided free care, have the opportunity to see what's available to them on the health care connector. What does that mean? That means that has to be part of your strategy. You have to understand that first, and second, you have to understand at what point do those employees qualify for subsidies. I often get the question on our hotline, probably, we probably get 10, 15, 20 calls a day, about health insurance reform on the AIM hotline. A very common one is, I have less than 50 employees. I don't have to worry about the Affordable Care Act, right? My answer is no. Because the Affordable Care Act requires everyone to get insurance. There's the individual mandate. And now, whether you work for an employer with, fit, with 20 employees or 2,000 employees, your employees if they do not have affordable care of minimum value through you, may qualify for a subsidy at the state through the connector that makes that insurance more affordable to them and their families. What does that mean? That means an employer with 20 employees may find that two, three, ten of their employees move off their plan and onto the state plan, or, the, or through the connector, I should say, not the state plan, get individual insurance through the connector, you're left with a maybe an entirely different demographic that may affect what your insurance premiums are based upon rating factors available. So this is something every employer really has to factor in to their strategy and their economic decision making on what they do to establish the employee contributions. What makes uh, health care affordable or not affordable? If you go to the next slide. Oops, sorry. That's okay. This is how I think I look at it that I think helps make sense of it. Affordability is based upon the household income of the individual. If you look at this graph, here you have across the x-axis the annual household income of the, of the employee, going from 20000 up to 100000 Up the y-axis is what the cost is for the lowest cost employer-sponsored insurance individual coverage that is of minimum value. So if you set the cost for your health insurance for the individual at a certain level, you're going to affect who has affordable insurance and who doesn't. On this demonstration here, the filled in blue area 
is the area above 9.5% of the household income. The yellow line is the cost of the employee only coverage. So you see down in that lower left hand corner, that's the group of people that work for you that may be eligible to get subsidized insurance. If you raise the cost, more eligible. If you lower the cost, fewer are eligible. And every time you raise and lower the cost, you affect what you pay and what your employees pay. So this is a dynamic that every employer has to factor in. Every benefits advisor needs to work with their, um, their clients to determine where, where you are going to put this strategically. Okay. Next point I'd like to make, documentation. I'm very happy to announce that last week another 360 pages of regulations came out <laughs> identifying what the rules are for some of the reporting requirements that will come forward. Some are final rules, some are proposed rules, but this is what we've been waiting for and to see some more information on. Essentially, at some point in time, well, essentially on January 1st, the folks at the connector will be charged with administering for the IRS the identification of who is getting a subsidy and notifying employers that Sue Smith applied for and received the subsidy through the connector. Sue Smith is employed by you, is a full-time employee. You are an applicable large employer. You will face a $250 a month assessment that won't be effective until 2015, but starting next year, you'll start getting notification of who's receiving assessments. How are you going to defend yourself against an assessment. <laughs> You'll have to demonstrate, are you in fact an applicable large employer? Do you have 50 or more full-time plus full-time equivalent employees? How are you tracking that? How are you working with your payroll and timekeeping providers to identify the total hours of service? How are you identifying those hours of service that aren't tracked through payroll? How are you keeping your records and how are you demonstrating that the assessment doesn't even apply to you if in fact you are under 50 employees. If you are an applicable large employer, how are you going to identify that the person who's getting a subsidy is or is not eligible for insurance through you and therefore you'll have to pay an assessment for them. You have to have your measurement period set up, your stability period set up. You have to know how you're measuring the hours of service for people now for when they qualify later. This is something you have to be doing now. Don't be thinking that because it's delayed, this is something you can put off. You're always measuring now, this year, for next year's eligibility. So just because assessment's been put off for a year, measuring is happening now. You need your plan in place, you need to be able to do it, do it, and you need to be able to show that you have a process to capture that information. So you may, have, you may be an applicable large employer. You may have a full-time employee who is getting a subsidy. But you may be able to take, care of, take advantage of some affordability safe harbors that will, will relieve you of an assessment. There's the W-2, the rate of pay, and the federal poverty level safe harbors. How are you going to demonstrate, are you ready to demonstrate that somebody who you are received notice that is getting a subsidy and you're getting an assessment, how are you going to be able to demonstrate that no, their prior year W-2 was this, that matches up to this, this time period, therefore I'm not, I'm not liable. How are you going to demonstrate rate of pay for an exempt employee versus an hourly employee? 
Are you going to make distinction between different classifications employee of how you measure rate of pay? All of these are things that you can't wake up on January 1st, 2015 and say, oh yeah, let's put this together now. These are things you have to have part of your strategy now to identify whether you will or will not face these assessments. And the final thing that I think employers should be thinking about is there is a lot of flexibility under the Affordable Care Act to take advantage of wellness incentives, particularly in the area of tobacco use. Under the regulations, you could offer all of your tobacco users a plan that is neither affordable nor of minimum value. That if they stop using tobacco becomes affordable and a minimum value. And that will be totally acceptable. You can greatly alter premiums, uh, premium contributions that the employee makes, and you can greatly alter out-of-pocket expenses. Realizing great cost savings to you, and also, perhaps, behavior-changing incentive to your employees, which should affect claims.